Good evening. Thank you for attending tonight. Every day, South King County is faced with a growing crisis of addiction. Locked doors, gated communities, city limits, county boundaries, nothing stops addiction. Doesn't care whether you support Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, or Donald Trump. Addiction affects every family. Though I must admit, after this presidential election, there are probably a lot more people addicted <laughs> trying to survive it. Tonight, we're having a growing conversation about addiction and recovery. It's an opportunity to bring us together to address the needs of people working throughout the complexities of addiction and recovery in our communities. This is a challenge that touches everyone. I believe we all know someone or have friends, colleagues, and family that are dealing with a loved one challenged by addiction and recovery. And due to a stigma of the challenge, I believe that statistics show that what we are seeing is only the tip of the iceberg. Public Broadcasting's Frontline recently broadcast a documentary showing the challenges and opportunities in our area. If you haven't seen this compelling documentary or the recent one on ABC's 2020, I urge you to do so and share with your friends. Our region has been mobilized by the recent appointment of the King County Heroin Opa Addiction Task Force. Four key members of this task force are members of our panel tonight. I also want to thank Thomas Jefferson High School for hosting and recognize their principal, Adrian Cheshon, and her staff for her help with this town hall. I believe there are a number of public officials here tonight. I'd like to ask all of them to please stand and be recognized for their public service. Before I introduce the panel, I would like to acknowledge the high school student leaders that are here in attendance tonight. Please stand and be recognized. The high schools represented are Auburn West High School, Federal Way Public Academy, Federal Way High School, Todd Beamer High School, and students from our host, Thomas Jefferson High School. Thanks for showing your commitment. When you are an addict, it is easy to get lost. It's hard to find your way. Yet for most addicts, asking for directions is not an easy thing to do. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about addiction and recovery from many angles. And after our long conversation tonight together, I'm hopeful that many of you tonight will find answers to the issues that have affected your family and yourselves. Our panelists today are all members of the King County Heroin and Opioid Addiction Task Force. We have Dan Satterberg, who was elected King County Prosecuting Attorney in November of 2007, succeeding his mentor, the late Norm Mailing. Dan served as Chief of Staff for Norm Mailing for 17 years. Before 1990, Dan was a trial attorney in the Criminal Division Special Assault Unit, Drug Unit, and the office's first gang prosecutor in 1988. He attended the University of Washington, both in undergraduate and law school. We also have representing from the Sheriff's Office, the Chief Deputy, Jim Pugel. Jim is the Chief Deputy at the King County Sheriff's Office overseeing patrol operations, criminal investigations, special operations, training 911 communications, records, and he's been involved as in a previous position as the Interim Police Chief for the City of Seattle. At SPD, he oversaw the department's homicide, robbery, fraud, auto theft, narcotics, major crimes, internet crimes against children, vice domestic violence, sexual assault, and crime scene investiga investigation units. Jim has been involved with LEAD, and he has extensive history of working with communities on resolving issues. Jim is a graduate of the University of Washington in political science and English, he graduated from the FBI National Academy in 1997. Our next speaker is uh, Harborview Chief Nursing Officer Darcy Jaffe. Darcy is the Chief Nursing Officer and Senior Associate Administrator at Harborview Medical Center, UW Medical Center in Seattle. 
She has been at Harbord View for over 20 years in multiple capacities. She is also adjunct uh, clinical faculty at the University of Washington School of Nursing. Darcy is a board certified as a nurse executive and a clinical specialist in adult psychiatry and mental health nursing. She received the Washington State Nurse Leader of the Year Award from the March of Dimes in 2014. She earned her undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Washington School of Nursing. And from the King County Community and Human Services, Brad Feingood. Brad is also co-chair of the task force and he has a master's degree in counseling with a specialty in addictions from Western Michigan University. Brad is a licensed counselor with 18 years in substance use abuse and also has worked in disorder and mental health. He currently serves as the assistant division director for the King County's Behavioral Health and Recovery Division. At this time, we're gonna begin with Brad and then proceed after each speaker to move down the line because our purpose tonight is to listen to you as well. So first of all, please join me in welcoming Brad Feingood. Hi everybody, my name is Brad Feingood and as Council Member Von Reich Bauer said, I'm the Assistant Division Director of Behavioral Health and Recovery. I'm the Behavioral Health Administrator for the county. So what that means in my current uh, position is I'm responsible for the administration of mental health and substance use disorder services countywide for Medicaid and low-income populations. Um, additionally, I am, uh, I'm honored to be one of the co-chairs of the Heroin and Prescription Opiate Task Force that was convened by um, Executive Dow Constantine, Seattle Mayor uh, Ed Murray, and Mayor Laws and Mayor Backus of the City of Renton and the City of Auburn. We can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a little bit about the task force. Um, the task force um, was called to order by our co-conveners who saw a significant problem. Basically, and, and I'll go through some of the data after talking about the task force. But basically in 2014, we saw um, a huge spike in the number of overdose deaths in the county. It was the all time high uh, number of overdose deaths related to opiate addiction uh, and opiate use disorder in the county wide. And so we realized that we needed to do something more about it, that there was uh, not a coordinated effort. And so the executive and, and our convening mayors came together and said, we need to bring together the experts in the community. And so the, the folks that you see on the table are all represented at, on our task force. There's, a, there's approximately 35 members of our task force, ranging from the medical community to the law enforcement community to the public schools, um, to um, all sorts of different communities, the peer community, people who have a lot of lived experience um, at the task force. So a little bit about the task force. The task force members are charged with developing recommendations uh, to the task force sponsors to rapidly address the epidemics of heroin and prescription opiate overdose in King County. Um, so the recommendations are gonna, will identify steps to both prevent uh, opiate addiction and improve uh, the outcomes for people who are addicted. So our goal is really to stop people from inappropriately uh, coming in contact and using opiates and also to do a better job of working with people, treating people and providing services for those who um, are impacted and who are the most vulnerable. One of the things that we know is that um, people who um, sometimes have resources can access treatment easier than those who don't have resources. We know that we have this growing population of homeless and people who are experiencing homelessness in our community, and those people often have problems accessing services. The task force uh, was focusing on recommended areas of prevention, expanded treatment, and user health services, including opiate overdose prevention. We know we have tools, it's just about being able to use the tools that we have at our disposal more effectively. So we're trying to use evidence-based and evidence-informed tools that'll have the greatest impact on the problem. So our task, it's really a short-lived task force, you know, a lot of people uh, came to us and said, oh, another task force, just what our community needs. And really from, from, the, uh, from the onset, 
One of the things that's really uh, significant about the work that we're doing is it's really short-lived. So we, so we were called to order in the spring, and we need to have a final report by the end of September. Include, and it was very clear in our initial charge that if there's things that we can do in the interim, we better implement. And so there's been a lot, there's been a number of things that we've been able to do um, in the interim. So the task force areas, we can go to the next slide. Um, so there's basically three areas that we talked about. There's prevention, there's treatment, and we, and, and we really thought it was important uh, to focus on user health services. We all, um, in the four of us on the panel, come in contact in, maybe not face to face, but our offices come in contact with people who are currently using and who aren't always ready to change, but we know that we need to be able to provide better services for them to change uh, that, that are available for them for when they're ready to change. Next slide. So the three uh, the three areas primary so uh, primary prevention the, um, the the we decided to to come in with some major focus areas. We didn't want this to be sort of a working task force that comes up with 500 recommendations that nothing ever gets implemented. So we decided really early to focus on some key high level things that we can implement that's gonna make the most amount of significant change. So in uh, primary prevention, we're focusing on prescriber education. So we know that doctor, we know that about four out of every five people who are new heroin users started with prescription drugs. And so that might be their prescription, it might not be their prescription, it might be their parents' prescription, it might be their grandparents' prescription, it might be um, pills that they got from school, but we know that there's a lot of um, destigmatization that happens with teenagers and using pills. We heard some of that from, uh, from the teenagers that we talked to earlier today. Uh, public education is part of primary prevention and secure medicine return. The county is doing, the county and the city are doing a tremendous job about turning out um, secure medicine take back and so being able to coordinate with those services that already exist. Under treatment expansion, we know that we need to be able to provide treatment on demand. When people need treatment and are ready to access treatment, we need to be able to provide treatment right there and then. We can't say, hey, that's great, we appreciate it, come back in three weeks from now because they might not be ready or they might pass away by then. Um, and innovative medication-assisted treatment prescribing practices, and that's really getting into the weeds of, of what we're doing. Under user health services, we're focused on two areas. Um, one of them is expanded access to naloxone, and if you don't know what naloxone is, it is the opiate overdose uh, antidote. So if somebody's in an, o in an active overdose, there's been a number of programs that have turned out, been turned out by the Sheriff's Department and law enforcement where if they come across somebody who's in an overdose state, they can spray this spray in their nose and it brings them back alive. I mean, it's just like an AED for people who are in active overdose. Um, and uh, this idea called a safe consumption site. So people who are not ready to stop using, who are currently using, one of the ideas that we've been talking about is is, is there an idea about a safe place that they can go to use to keep them safe and to keep further harm from happening? So those are, there's none of those in, in the United States, one in North America, about 70 around the world. Next. So it became evident really early on that we wanted to take an equity and social justice lens, right? Council Member Von Reichbauer um, and, and, the, um, and the county have passed the uh, equity and social justice ordinance. And this is something that we really, really, really find important to make sure that what we're doing is not furthering racial disparities and really being able to treat uh, people who need the, the most help. So um, I'll just read through this real quick. Task Force will apply an equity and social justice lens to all of its work. We acknowledge that the war on drugs has disproportionately adversely impacted some communities of color and it is important that supportive interventions now not inadvertently replicate that pattern. Interventions to address the King County heroin and opiate problem will or could affect the health and safety of diverse communities directly and indirectly. Measures recommended by the task force to enhance the health and well-being of heroin and opiate users or to prevent heroin and opiate addiction must be intentionally planned to ensure that they serve marginalized individuals and communities. At the same time, the response to heroin and opiate use must not exacerbate inequities in the care and response provided among users of various drugs. All recommendations of the task force will be reviewed using a racial impact statement framework. The task force will not seek to advance recommendations that can be expected to widen racial or ethnic disparities in health, healthcare, or other services. Wherever possible, whenever possible, these concerns should lead to broadening the recommendations of the task force 
rather than leaving behind interventions that are predicted to enhance the health and well-being of heroin and opiate users. One of the things that we talked about earlier with, our, with the, with the um, high schoolers that were involved is that we're starting to look about uh, substance use disorders as a public health issue, not a law enforcement issue. Um, our, my colleagues here will tell you, I would think, because I've talked to them many times, that we've tried for years and years and years to incarcerate the problem away, and it hasn't worked. Um, if we can go to the next slide. A couple of trends, right, to talk about um, why we're here, right? So in King County, heroin and opiate trends. 40% of drugs confiscated in King County tested positive for heroin in two, 2015. So of the arrests that were made by, um, by, uh, uh, by the King County Sheriff's Department uh, and Chief Deputy Pugil and that have, you know, came through uh, Prosecutor Satterberg's office, 40% of those drugs confiscated have had heroin in it. And that's up from 7% in 2008. So what you can see is that sharp increase. Next slide. In our publicly funded treatment system, which I'm responsible for, uh, and our office is responsible for, uh, heroin treatment admits have doubled since 2010. So since 2010, what you'll see in this chart is that heroin treatment admits have doubled, and at the same time, prescription drug um, treatment admits have shrunk. So we know that some of the things that we put in place to keep uh, uh, prescription uh, from getting out in the community has worked, but what's happened is people have turned to heroin because it's more expensive and harder to get prescriptions, but that's where people start. Next slide. Since 2006, at our, at our publicly funded needle exchange, the total number of needles that have been exchanged have tripled. So we're approaching seven million needles that have been exchanged every single year. A Couple other slides. The number of young adults seeking detox for opiates has quadrupled since 2006. So from 2006 to 2014, the people who are, who are trying to get into detox for opiates have tripled. Next, real quick. So, and here's the one that really brought everything to light for us, right? Heroin overdose deaths. In 2009, there were 49 heroin overdose deaths. Five years later, in 2014, that number more than tripled to 156 people had, o had overdose deaths in the county involving heroin. Um, so, you know, when we talk about answers, one of the things we talked about was treatment on demand. We know that medication-assisted treatment, so Suboxone, Methadone, cuts the risk in half of people to overdose, um, to overdose. And the other thing that we know is that if we can provide housing for people, um, that also positively impacts people's treatment outcomes. And with that, I stayed within my 10 minutes or 11 minutes, pretty close, and I turn it over to Darcy. Thank you. Can I, um, Thank you. Go to the next slide. Oh, okay. So I've been asked to talk about uh, challenges um, within the healthcare community in treating addiction. Um, and I will say I only have 10 minutes, so I had to uh, limit it. I could talk to you for several days about the barrier. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, you can see from the slide here that the barriers associated with treatment are, uh, are immense and can be overwhelming. The, um, so I'm going to talk to you about three main categories tonight, about funding, about the, um, the individuals themselves, and then a, a little bit more about some of the barriers that we're seeing in the health, uh, in the actual treatment part of it. So next slide, please. So I have to say that we always talk about, whenever we talk about barriers, the first thing we talk about is there's not enough money. And that, um, you know, if we only had enough money, then we would have whatever we needed. The, um, Here's some examples of, of ways that not having enough money have gotten in the way of being denied admission to treatment facilities because the insurance company won't cover it. So even if you have insurance, you might not be eligible for treatment. Um, that um, because heroin withdrawal itself, although very uncomfortable, is not life-threatening, it's very hard to get admitted for just heroin withdrawal itself. You can die from taking too much, but withdrawing for it really can't kill you in and of itself that um, most programs are funded by the government. And no offense to this guy here, but the government just doesn't, ha doesn't have enough money and doesn't really fund things to the degree that um, really is out there for the need. So I took a look at what the state Medicaid plan says right now for what it covers for people who are on Medicaid. And in the um, purple box there, it says that people covered by Medicaid can get medically necessary behavioral health services at no cost. 
Sounds great, right? Okay, except the, the kind of fine print there is medically necessary. And what that means to you and what that means to the plan aren't, aren't the same thing. And that's where we have a lot of that mismatch and where you'll see the, uh, the physician, the individual, and the payer not always on the same um, place of what is medically necessary for treatment. There's also not, a, from an um, inpatient perspective for heroin withdrawal, there's not necessarily really good evidence-based treatments to help to, to support what's medically necessary. And then I thought, you know what? I'm a state employee. I should have really good insurance, right? I should be able to get anything I want if I was having a problem with opiate addiction. So I w went on to my plan. Just looked yesterday. It says, if you're admitted to the hospital from an emergency room, the, deduct the copay will be waived. That's great. Uh, but you remember, they're not going to admit you because heroin withdrawal is not a life-threatening -threaten condition. But inpatient chemical dependency treatment is subject to clinical review. So even with really, and I have the best state insurance there is, just to let you know that, even with that, the likelihood that I'm gonna be able to get admitted from an emergency department into chemical dependency treatments, not very high. So there's barriers right there very, from the very beginning. And, the, you know, and we also know that people with a lot of money don't necessarily get into treatment. We hear about it all the time. Next slide, please. So speaking of people who need treatment, there are a lot of, even if you have all the money in the world, even if you're Prince, even if you're Kurt Cobain, opiate addiction is more about just the money. There's stigma, we've talked about that a little bit already. It's, you know, it's just, even though the idea of taking um, opiates is, a, taking opiates is a little less stigmatizing maybe than it was, it's becoming a, li a little bit of the new normal, it's still a stigma. And it's still, you know, it's still, we're trying to make it a disease, but it's still a moral, it's failing in a lot of people's eyes. The, um, and, we, and when we talked with the high schoolers, you know, if you're a kid and you talk to someone about the fact that you're using drugs, you are at risk of suspension, of being, getting into trouble, of having some things that in, you know, in, a, in anybody's uh, perspective isn't something that you necessarily want to take the chance on. The other thing about, in particular, open heroin addiction is that it causes depression and changes in your brain. And so that even in people that are depressed don't always see that, they're able, that they need treatment and the treatment that they need. They're not willing to accept the help. And the, the brain changes are real with opiate addiction. If we don't take that into consideration, if the person that is addicted doesn't realize the changes that are happening on a neurochemical basis are causing them not to be able to accept treatment, then it gets in the way. And then even with the best of all that, people in general just aren't always very good about taking care of themselves or accepting treatment. Chronic diseases in general aren't very well taken care of. People, you know, diabetes, heart conditions, you know, high cholesterol, people aren't necessarily doing what they're supposed to do. So there's just that sort of human condition and all that can get in the way. So let's say you got all the money in the world and you're right there <clears throat> ready for treatment. So then what's the next barrier? Next slide. So I wanna talk about um, some of the history about why pain meds are so easily prescribed. And, and Rad's right, we're getting a little bit of a handle on it, at least locally, but nationally we're not really. About a decade ago, there was um, a movement of pain as the fifth vital sign in the medical community. And it was uh, very well intended, it, people with a lot of chronic pain, there was concern that their pain wasn't being well managed, that they weren't being, um, taken seriously by the healthcare providers. And so there was a lot of pressure put on, the, on physicians in the medical community to make sure that people's pain was um, taken care of to the point where, the, where pain wasn't an issue anymore. The, um, there, are, uh, there are what are called HCAPs, and I have that HCAPs ratings, my pain was well controlled. This is a publicly reported patient satisfaction data point that you can go on, you can go on right now and Google it and you can compare different facilities on how well they're doing it. Everybody wants five stars. In order to do that, you know, my pain was well controlled. What, what I say versus what you say is very subjective. And so physicians are put in the situation of having to prescribe a lot of times medications that they just don't know how to prescribe very well. And it's not only that you want to have five stars in the eyes of the world, there's money attached to that. So Medicare and, some, and commercial insurance will say, if you're not doing what the, um, 
what the patient wants and we're not going to pay you as much. So there's all these weird incentives involved in it. Um, you can see the, at the bottom of the slide, you know, um, will pain meds be out of reach? There's a lot of fear of people with chronic and very severe pain that some of this movement away from opiate prescriptions are going to get in the way and, and they're not going to be able to have the pain control that they need. And that's a legitimate risk that we need to um, consider. So, you can, so there's a lot of problems associated with trying to prescribe opiates effectively. Next slide, please. However, you can see that the prescription of opiate painkillers is pretty significant. And I put up here, I thought it might be interesting to see where is Washington across the country in terms of how many painkillers, um, opiate painkillers are being prescribed. So you can see we're kind of in the middle. We're not the worst. We're not the best. Um, but when well, that kind of that kind of describes Washington, right? Um, but um, but we got a ways to go. There's areas in the country you can see um, a little more towards the eastern part of our country that are um, they have some they're having some more problems. The and we're looking at this, and so we're getting better data. So this is helping, but we don't understand this very well. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit more. Um, we um, have seen since 1999 a 300% increase in the prescription of opiates in the U.S. The, um, and so that's, um, that would be fine, except what we're not seeing is that people are reporting that their pain is better control. So we're giving a lot of pills and it's not working, and we're still doing it, right? Um, enough prescriptions so that um, every adult in America can have your own bottle of pain meds. Uh, it's a lot of meds. And you know, it, some of this stuff's not very expensive, so it's pretty easy to prescribe it. I will tell you, my sister-in-law, who um, lawyer, you know, just uh, went to get her wisdom teeth pulled out. She got 30 days worth of Vicodin. I was like, we took it away from her. But um, the, and we're going to drop it off at your little site there. So, but but in general, I mean, really, 30 days of Vicodin, and then you put it in your, you know, you put it in there in case you might need it someday, right? Um, and as I put in there, and as Brad has said, you know, 55 to 70 percent, depending on where you where you get your information, use painkillers for non-medical reasons, and they get them from that extra Vicodin that your sister-in-law has. And one in 15 people who do that get addicted to heroin. So we've really set up the system that we have. So it's um, it's not surprising. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, that system is has a really clear and startling relationship to death rates. The more painkillers we, we sell, the more people that die. So it's not just a matter of trying to figure out what are we going to do, how are we going to satisfy this person and that person, are we going to get paid, are we going to get enough stars. It's really serious, serious business to not do this right. But it is hard. I will tell you for the physicians and those that prescribe the medications, they have a lot of different pressures on them. And, there's a, and there are also, there is a, a startling lack of understanding in the medical community about how to manage pain. There are other ways to manage pain besides, medic, besides pills, but um, we're a pretty pill-oriented country, and there's a lot of um, and it's very difficult at this 15-minute uh, sessions that physicians have to try to talk about other um, other ways to manage pain. And then, um, but, last slide, I think, yeah. So, for, be, remember, this is, this, is a, this is a brain disease. Once you're addicted to opiates, it's a brain disease. So, as in most, medic, as most diseases, there's a medication that can help with it. And Brad talked about medication-assisted treatment. That's what works. We don't really, un it's not very well understood in the medical community yet, but they're starting, to, it's starting to get, better understood, but there's a lot of rules and regulations for this too. It's not easy for doctors to do this, even if they want to. And, and honestly, there's a lot of them that don't want to yet for um, all kinds of reasons, and that's a barrier that we need to overcome, and I think this task force is really making a lot of good headway on that. Um, with that, those are my 10 minutes of barriers. So thank you, and I'm going to pass it on to Jim. Hello. Oh, clap. <laughs> no, no, you. Oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, Council Member Von Rackbauer, thank you very much for creating this uh, panel tonight and for inviting all the people in here. Uh, thank you all for being here on such a beautiful night. We know the sun only comes out in the Northwest about 10 times a year. <laughs> and the fact that you're here instead of doing something else is very impressive. Most of all, I'd like to thank the students who showed up tonight. Um, we 
here the panel and uh, council member von Rackbeier had the chance to talk with you and the sense of uh, uh, situational awareness that you all have, the sense of reality, the sense of hope gave me and the other panel members a lot of hope in our future. Um, I commend you for what you've done so far, how art articulate you are, and uh, all these kids are just amazing. So we are very lucky to have you here tonight and, and have you in our society. Um, I've been in law enforcement since 1983. I was with the Seattle Police Department for 31 years and have been with the King County Sheriff's Office for the last two years. And for the first 25 years of my career, either as a police officer, an undercover officer, a sergeant, a lieutenant, or captain, our, one of our missions, uh, we all said that we were there to serve and protect, but we really were at war with certain parts of the community. And we weren't there alone. There were judges and jailers and some prosecutors and elected officials who were uh, t told us to go to war, but we were actually going to our communities and taking people who we thought were bad criminals, but as you've just heard, they were actually ill. Um, I'm not talking about the for-profit drug dealer, the, the huge importer who's not using, who's not uh, addicted at all, who's just profiting other, off of others' illnesses. But I'm talking about the low-level, nonviolent drug user, drug seller, sex worker out on the street and we were putting them in prison and really not putting a lot of the big kingpins in prison because they were so insulated. Um, about five years ago, through many different motivations, the prosecutor's office, the uh, uh, Seattle Police Department, the King County Sheriff's Office, Defenders Association, uh, a very eclectic group of uh, civil society people, government people, business people all got together in, in King County and looked at the uh, horrific toll that we had taken on, on not just on the local community of King County, but what the war on drugs, uh, the war on our communities had done nationwide. We had incarcerated huge amounts of people. Tonight with the students, we, they talked about the downstream effects. If something happens to them in high school, uh, it will, impact negatively where they get into college or who they can be employed by, which I applaud you guys for having that uh, thought now at this age. Most people don't get that until they're in their 20s. Um, but we, government, gave these people a, a big burden to carry by convicting them of predominantly people who were ill, who were addicted, and now because of a felony conviction, uh, it is, um, uh, un until recently, you couldn't get Pell Grants uh, for colleges, you couldn't get public housing. It was very difficult to get certain licenses uh, uh, or to get into certain professions because of this one mark on your record from years ago. We were continuing to punish people. So that really brought a revelation to me. Um, I believe right now we're in a very promising era of policing uh, when it comes to mental illness and when it comes to drug use and drug addiction. This group that I mentioned earlier that we all got together uh, created what's uh, uh, called the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And we looked at the people that we were constantly arresting and prosecuting and jailing and then putting on supervised release and then who were going back into the same lifestyle. And we were doing the same thing over and over again. And if you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome, that's called insanity. But that's what we were doing, is we were engaged in the same pattern of behavior, expecting a different outcome. So what LEAD does is, uh, at point of arrest, when the person, um, uh, comes into contact with the police officer, whether they're uh, uh, using, whether they're addicted, whether they're just in possession, or even if they're selling and they're not an exploitative uh, seller or uh, someone who exploits other and they're not selling for profit, they're just selling to pay their rent, put gas in the car, or quite often so that they can get enough money to buy their drugs. So we will take this cohort of people and if they're amenable to treatment, 
uh, or to counseling and coming up with a case management plan, we will immediately turn them over, not to the jailer, but we will uh, call a group that's been contracted, REACH, uh, out of Evergreen Treatment Service Providers in King County, and that police officer will connect them immediately with that case manager. The case manager will meet with them for 15, 30, 45 minutes and do an initial assessment. And if they agree to come in within the next 30 days and uh, engage in, a, in, in developing a comprehensive work plan uh, to address their homelessness, to address their joblessness, uh, their hygiene needs, their education needs, their addiction needs. Uh, if they are willing to do that, then the prosecutor has agreed not to charge them for that one crime. It doesn't mean that it's a get out of jail card free or, or free card. It doesn't mean that if they're involved in another criminal enterprise or another crime later on that they won't get charged. It doesn't mean that at all. It just shows that <coughs> government the prosecutors, the police, the medical community have all come to our senses and are approaching it uh, in a much more promising way. Uh, uh, so that's a positive thing that we can uh, thank our elected folks and the appointed leaders of the county and the cities to finally saying, okay, let's do something different and help our communities. Another thing that's very promising is, as Brad mentioned, uh, the use of naloxone, which is the opioid antidote. And it doesn't necessarily save a life per se, but it reverses the overdose. Previously, mostly only advanced medics could carry that out in the field. Recently, though, the, the public health people and the folks who ran the jail started issuing it, at least in the uh, Mayling Regional Justice Center, to anyone who had been engaged in opioid use or was likely to engage in it once they get out of jail. Uh, so those folks were actually being trained, hey, don't use, but if you're going to, or if you have a friend, a family member, or someone else, make sure you have this with you. As Brad said, it's nasal injected. It takes anywhere from 20 to 40 seconds to reverse. Um, and you can reverse that uh, instant case. Uh, we've now issued it to a select group of Seattle police uh, officers in downtown Seattle where a, a disproportionate amount of overdose on the street occurs and also to the King County Sheriff's Office that polices the sound transit and metro bus systems as well as White Center and Burien and uh, the unincorporated little pockets that surround us right here. Um, so those are two promising aspects <coughs> where Policing is finally saying, we don't know really what's going on. Uh, we aren't going to tell you anything, uh, or from now on, we're gonna work with our community and with the medical community and the legal community uh, to figure out better ways to not punish people for being ill, to try to help them to move on, and uh, to just make our communities safer and healthier, and that's what uh, the original roles of police officers uh, were supposed to do, make the community healthier and safer. So I've used my 10 minutes. Thank you again for being here, and now Dan Satterberg. Thank you, Jim. And that, that is, of course, the ultimate goal of any strategy is to make the community safer and healthier and, and to help uh, prevent addiction before it begins, and starting with, with the education of our, of our kids. Uh, this is not my first drug epidemic. I started in 1985 as a prosecutor, and back then was when crack cocaine was all the rage, and it hit the streets, and our legislature did what, what every legislature in the country did, which was to jack up sentences and to give primary responsibility for this drug epidemic to the criminal justice system. This time around, I think we're getting smarter about it. I think uh, that the role of the, of the uh, police and prosecutors is to step back and to listen to the researchers, the experts, the families, the people impacted by this, and say, how can we help? 
how can we do no harm? How can we support? There is a role. If we catch somebody who's selling heroin for profit, I have no problem sending them to prison. The people who are breaking into your home or into your cars to get money for their drug addiction, they're going to be held accountable. But that accountability might also include uh, drug treatment. It might be a, a drug court sentence instead. Uh, because we know that until we get to the root of that problem, that if you're an addict, if you're an addicted person and you wake up in the morning, your first and only thought is, where am I going to get my drugs today? And so your only option is either to begin to suffer the very unpleasant withdrawal symptoms or to go out and commit a small crime to get some property to trade for drugs. That's the property crime that we see, the auto glass on the streets uh, of our communities from car prowls is, is almost all directly related to addiction and to the very bleak options that an addicted person has uh, when they need to fix every single day. So what I've tried to do this time around is to learn more. Back in the 80s when I was prosecuting these cases, I thought all I needed to know is the statutes. But I think I need to know a lot more than that. And since summer is coming up, I have a couple of summer reading suggestions for you. If you come in here on this night to learn more, I would suggest a couple of books. The first one is called Dreamland by a journalist named Sam Quinones. He tells the infuriating story of how we got here. And it started with the pharmaceutical companies who created uh, the, these miracle pain relievers and marketed it to the doctors saying, you can prescribe this to your patients without worry about it being addictive. It's not addictive. And in here it talks about the, 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 the lack of, of, of study behind that, that statement that was widely uh, understood and widely uh, accepted by the medical profession. And on that map that Darcy showed, uh, some of the Appalachian states, particularly West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, uh, unscrupulous doctors took, took, together with the pharmaceutical industry, created pill mills where they were, they were distributing tremendous numbers of, of um, very addictive oxycodone particularly, but other um, opi synthetic opiates that got people hooked. And, and, and for a Medicaid copay, so you might pay about $5, you could get a, a jar of oxycodone that would be worth a couple thousand dollars on the street. And these are very poor areas with not a lot of economy. All of a sudden, the economy was pushing these opiate pills. And what happened is when they shut those down and when, when it became more difficult to get opium, by the way, an oxycodone pill is worth a dollar a milligram on the street. So if you have an 80 milligram pill, you can get $80 for that. But after a while, that, that gets expensive. You can't afford that. And, and this Dreamland book tells the, next, the story about the next wave, which was black tar heroin that came up from Mexico, and a single kilo could net over $100,000 in profit. And it's one small town in Mexico where it all came from. The young men would come up, and a kind of a rite of passage. They'd come up and sell uh, black tar heroin to uh, opiate addicts in the United States. For six months or a year, make enough money to go back and buy the farm, and, and, and it was sort of their graduate school. It's really, it's, a, it's a, something we all need to understand how this happened. This is a man-made epidemic, and it, we have to understand how it was made in, in order to figure out how to unmake it. Uh, and a lot of the responsibility does fall on, on the medical community, on the pharmaceutical community. The other book that, I, that I've read that I would recommend to you is called The Unbroken Brain by Maya Zalotvitz. And in this, and there's lots of books about the, the physiological part of addiction because you know it's not just about that drugs are out there. Drugs are not like mosquitoes that land on you and, and bite you and then you're addicted. People have to have to be susceptible to becoming an addict. You, not everybody who does heroin or does an oxycodone becomes an addict. But uh, her, her analysis of, the, of all the studies that have been done shows that about half of the reason that people become addicted is because they have a genetic predisposition. That something in their brain, they've inherited some susceptibility to um, becoming addicted. The other half of the people who don't have that genetic predisposition have some sort of emotional, environmental, untreated trauma in their life that, that they find uh, in, in, an opiate takes care of. All of a sudden they feel normal. They feel healthy when they start taking the opiate because until then they felt so awful. And so there's a real, f we don't understand much about the brain. I think we understand more about outer space than we do about the space between our ears. But we're starting to understand how the brain craves drugs, why it craves drugs, 
and understanding some of the ways that we might be able to lessen that. So I've made it a, a kind of a personal commitment for myself, this drug epidemic, to learn more about how we got here, how we can kind of can begin to, to slow this train down, but also appreciate what happens in, in the human brain and the human soul uh, that creates this, this disease. And, and she'll argue um, that this is a learned behavior. Addiction is a learned behavior. And once you begin to do it, you know, the brain, your body likes opiates, right? It, it, it's, it, it, naturally, there's receptors up in the brain, and, and once they get it, they, they like it, and they're telling your body, we want to continue to do this because it gives us that thing that we want, until all of a sudden it no longer provides the euphoria and instead starts to make you sick. And, and, and then you really have to have it, or otherwise life gets uh, very uncomfortable. So I would recommend that as a community that we learn more about uh, addiction, uh, more about, and, and more about treatment. You know, there's a, there's our historical approach to treatment has been the 12-step program and abstinence, and, and that is a program that works for millions of people and has for a long, long time. But the, the other side of that is, is some of the exciting things that are happening in the medication-assisted treatment with Suboxone, which actually blocks those opiate receptors in the brain. So if a person, if you wake up in the morning and you're an addict, maybe you have a, a choice other than going out and committing a crime to get a fix if you could get the Suboxone, which will actually take care of that craving for that day and you won't need to fix. In fact, if you used heroin on Suboxone, you wouldn't feel any effect at all because your opiate receptors are already occupied by the Suboxone, which does not cause a euphoria and allows people to kind of get their life back together. So there, there, I think there are some promising things if, if, if we stand down a little bit on the law enforcement side, let the medical professionals and the treatment professionals kind of help, help us figure out how we can be helpful and not do more harm uh, to, to this problem. Uh, so we know now that putting people in prison who are addicted to drugs is not an effective solution. It doesn't make us safer. It just costs us a lot of money and as soon as they get out of prison or jail, if they haven't had drugs and they want to use them right away, if they relapse, that's when we see our fatalities because they can't take that same amount of drugs that they used to before they stop taking drugs. So it's, we're learning a lot about what our proper role is. But I think the main thing is there's no, there's no magic pill. I mean, we're not, not going to get a pill to solve the problems that was caused by the pill. If you've ever had an addict in your family, you know that they test your patience and they test, they test your, your willingness to help them. Addicts cheat and steal and lie, and they do it first to the people around them. Uh, and then often they, you know, the people that you see in the tents and the you know, homeless and are out in the streets, and they, they come from families. They had a place. That, that they belonged to, that, that they tested their patients and they were, they were kicked out. You know, so, so much of, the, of what has to happen in the, whether you're doing the 12-step program or the medication-assisted treatment, the assistance has to be, there has to be people. There have to be people there who care enough to establish a relationship with the addicted person, to make them feel like they're worth helping to make them see that there is hope. And that's really, really hard work. And most of us are not capable of doing it, but if we understand that that's what it needs to be done and we can urge the expenditure of our resources to increase that capacity, then well, we're, we've learned something from the last go around uh, in the 1980s. Okay. I'd like to remind everyone here too that this panel as full-time jobs and the fact that they came out here tonight shows that they're not just involved in this concern, they're committed to helping resolve this problem, be part of the recovery. So again, th I wanna thank the panel. At this time, it's an opportunity for questions, um, whether it's the students we have here. I know I see a number of principals in the audience. I see the, some mayors and some other elected officials. So this might be an opportunity for citizens public officials, educators, or the like to step up to the microphone and have a question, and we'd welcome any, any participation. For the record, could you just identify yourself and, and your community? Thank you. Please identify yourself. Oh, my name is Nancy McElhinney. I'm from Federal Way, Washington. And the Seattle Times uh, article on June 5th had an editorial about this particular subject. It says, yet around the region, municipalities have resisted allowing facilities from opening in their borders. D 
delaying vital services that can help in the appalling trends of rising heroin ab abuse and death. So I'm just wondering if through the panel's discussions with other communities or whatever, or that you're finding there is a resistance to open up these facilities to help. And the other question is, you mentioned the books and the information that's in those books. And um, I don't know if there's an age of addiction when this starts, but if it is at a certain grade level, if there is actually health classes that are encouraged to give information to the students in the capacity that we're learning tonight, is that a possibility of it happening as well? So first of all, as far as the communities, are, are we finding resistance to open? I think what the Seattle Times was referring to, perhaps, and it's a, a local issue, is there was a plan to cite a drug treatment program up in the Woodmont neighborhood, and there was tremendous opposition uh, from that neighborhood. You know, the, the not in my backyard was very familiar to hear that, but the problem is that you already have heroin in your backyard. And they were arguing this is 500 feet from a, a school. Well, I'll guarantee you that they have heroin within 500 feet of that school. So the community rallied to reject the solution to the problem, choosing to keep the problem invisible. Uh, and I think, I think one of the things we all have to accept is that in our community, I, wherever you live in King County, you're not very far away from a heroin user. Uh, and if we were going to try to bring treatment to the people who need it, we can't have them all come take a bus downtown to Seattle to get their help. They got to, help has to be where they live. And just to I'll answer your other question, then I'll pass it down the, that line. Um, there is an age for addiction, and, the, and that's why it's so important. We're here in a school, and we have student leaders who can help spread this word. The, the longer a, a person um, waits before, for instance, if, if you don't take a drink until you're 21, your chance of becoming an alcoholic drops by half. So the longer you can wait to, to abstain from these things, uh, the better your chance of not being addicted. And conversely, the earlier you start to use any sort of mind-altering drugs, the more likely it is by a, by a great margin that you will have an issue with it later. So are schools addressing the issue then, as far as you know, or are they? Well, I, everything I know I learned this evening when I was having dinner with these students, and, and it, it sounds like, uh, you know, we, and I know we ask our schools to do an awful lot, but it sounds okay. like this is a part of the curriculum that could be beefed up. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, you know, the, um, the, <coughs> the PBS Forefront documentary that uh, Council Member Von Regbauer talked about did a really good job of documenting um, the, uh, the story of the city of Bremerton, which had a huge heroin problem. And so a treatment, uh, they asked for treatment. And so they were attempting to opening up a treatment facility, and they were basically roadblocked and roadblocked and roadblocked. And so the story documents the problem. And because they weren't able to bring treatment to that community, the number of dirty needles that were found on the street, the number, the, how the opiate uh, overdose cause, uh, have, resulting in death just increased exponentially. So what Prosecutor Satterberg talked about is really, really important to understand, which is that th the problem already exists. But if you're afraid to bring treatment to the problem, to, to the people experiencing the issues, then the treatment's just gonna get worse, right? And so, you know, we talked about what happened in Woodmont. Um, and it was really sad, you know, one of the, you know, so I personally, and, and I will tell anybody that I know today because I'm not ashamed to share it, I, I am the survivor of a younger brother who died of a drug overdose, right? And so one of the, one of the stories, or one of the pictures that's, that stands out most to me about the Woodmont experience was a picture of three kids in a doorway holding a sign that says, that says, uh, yeah, kids before addicts, right? And, the, and, and to me, that was one of the most amazing telltale signs ever because everybody who is experiencing addiction was a kid. You know, and if we don't, and if we don't give them help as a kid, then they're going to suffer. You know, and as somebody who, and one of the things that Prosecutor Satterberg that said that I'll disagree with a little bit, which is that, People who are experiencing addiction will lie, cheat, and steal. My brother, who died of a drug overdose, 
I mean, I'm sure he did do a little bit of lying, cheating, and stealing, but we never knew. So maybe that's the lying. That's the lie, right? <laughs> you know? He never stole from me, and I'm sure he probably cheated in a game of cards or something like that. But he was, he, he was a good kid. He was a college graduate, held a good job, you know, functioned well. I saw him every single day, and I worked in this field. We got a phone call on New Year's Day that he had died of a drug overdose, right? And so if we can, you know, reduce stigma and bring help to people who need help, then, then we'll start to succeed in this battle. I don't want to relive the Woodmont experience, but I would like Ken Taylor to come up and maybe share a comment or two, because he's been uh, through this experience with Valley Cities. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, and members of the panel for being here tonight. Yes, uh, my name's Ken Taylor. I'm the CEO of Valley Cities. Um, I happen to think that we had an extraordinarily good idea and that we were going to locate five buildings on a campus, about eight acres at the corner of 272nd and Pack Highway. And uh, our idea was resoundingly rejected. And um, I heard uh, fascinating things from the community um, and from elected officials about the damage that we were going to do to the community. And I never honestly quite understood that because I've worked in the treatment business for over 30 years now, and I know that everywhere we go, we make things better. And yet I also know that had Valley Cities not bought two former treatment properties, those properties would have been converted to some other use, and the chances of siting 100 beds in King County, Washington, are almost nil, almost impossible to find sites, to find neighborhoods, to find cities that will say, yes, we'll take you. We'll take you and your kind. And, and, and I want to echo Brad's sentiment because my son, um, one of my dear children, is a graduate of a drug treatment court in, Olymp in Olympia. And while he was in drug treatment court, he completed his bachelor's degree. And he went on to work for the state of Washington as a policy analyst. So the people we're talking about are us, absolutely are us. These are not some grotesque character that you see on TV. These are us. And the problem is here. So we can deny that the problem is here. But by doing so, people are dying. I mean, it really is life and death. And I'm hoping the students may want to ask some of the questions. I know you had a chance in private to talk about things, but it might be an opportunity because this uh, program tonight is being filmed and can be broadcast countywide. And I'd love to get some of the student involvement later on if they're interested. Well, while I understand, uh, I'm. Representative Linda Kochmar, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your work, uh, Prosecutor Satterberg, and all of you who are working so diligently, and also Ken Taylor in this field. I understand that this is a very difficult problem that we're dealing with. We're dealing with it in all of the cities, and uh, we're dealing with it in the city of Fidway, in the city of um, Des Moines, which is where Woodmont was located, where this uh, project was going to be was very close to an elementary school and right next to a library. And so I'm gonna speak on behalf of the citizens. The concern that they had for that particular location was that the lockdown facility that was gonna be one of the five buildings was going to be housed within a uh, gated area on the backside close to the elementary school, it's my understanding, and that they were going to have a, a methadone clinic where they were going to bus people in every day to get the methadone. Uh, which sounds fine, except that the citizens in the area were very concerned about their children going to school, were very concerned about the fact that the people coming in for the methadone may stay, stay in the library and not leave, uh, and they were very concerned about their property values. But one of the bigger concerns with the city of Des Moines is a, a small city, and it does not have very many police officers. And so that was a big concern because that's a financially strapped city. And so um, while they all wanted to be um, working with this project, 
and it's true they didn't want it in their backyard, but those were the two biggest concerns, the methadone clinic and the lockdown facility. And uh, Valley Cities is in that area. It's, it's just a little bit further to the north. So that was the concern of the citizens, and I'm, I'm very glad that we found a, a good resolution. Thank you. Did, did anybody have any questions they want to ask of the panel at this time? It's a good opportunity, and I know these students did some really good questions earlier. We might get you an extra grade. <laughs> or an extra cookie. There's extra food out there. Um, I know we have two great uh, principals in the audience, from one Todd Beamer and one from TJ. Do they want to make any comments or thoughts from their perspective as educators who deal with this issue every day of their lives? And, and I'd welcome both of uh, them, if they're, either one of them would love to come forward, or both of them, because I'm fond of both of them and have had the opportunity to work with both on their great schools, Todd Beamer and, and TJ. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adrian Chacon, principal here of TDIC. And I'm Joni Hall, I'm the principal of Todd Beamer High School. And I think um, from a school's perspective, I hear all the conversations about you know, safety and trying to get more support. For us, it's all about trying to help our kids, doing everything we can to provide every resource possible, and we are so strapped for support. And we're constantly trying to look out and see how we can help our kids with the whole child needs. Education becomes second if a kid can't sit in class and hear you or know that you you care about them. You can't teach them, and uh, it's it's for us. We're constantly looking for ways to support our kids in some other way, and we want to embrace communities, people locally, not having to send our kids all the way to the you know the, the nearby cities. It would be wonderful to have something in all of our local surrounding areas to to provide it for our kids. Um, I'll second Adrian on that. And I will say, too, that th this is something that doesn't know any boundaries. It's not, it's not the horrible bad kid that's dressed in black chains and, and mean and nasty. It's everybody's child. And, um, and our kids are up against a lot these days in what they experience and what they have to say no to. And, and when kids do have issues and problems, getting them help is difficult. And punishment doesn't work. When you punish a child and ask them to walk away from school and stay out of school, they get behind in school and they walk back into the same situation with the same issues and the same pressures without any kind of resources that help them have a different answer. Um, and so I think that's where we need to spend our dollars and our time and our energy is how do we help kids um, to, to be able to say no? And when they do choose the wrong pathway, how instead of punishing them and try to fix it with punishment, how do we give them the help and the backing to be able to walk in and have a different answer? Because it's always going to be there. And, and the question and the invitation is always Always going to be there for everybody and how do we do that from our kids who are little tiny all the way up and recognizing that the kids are getting this not just from one place they're getting it from all places um, sometimes at home in their community in their school in the greater community in the world at large turn on the TV um, it's a tough it's a tough world for teenagers these days and so again um, increasing the resources that our kids have available and increasing the things that we have out there for kids to do that are good choices. Um, because when they walk out the door at 2.05 in the afternoon, what is there out there for every kid, especially the kids that, the kids that don't have access to um, soccer club and a parent that will drive that can drive them somewhere or the money to play lacrosse or those kinds of things what's out there for our kids to go and do that's good and correct and what are we offering them especially in our community um, and close by them that they have access to that are good choices and because they have to do something and the hours from two o'clock to five and six and seven o'clock at night are long. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm looking for and that's what I wanna offer our kids is a different choice. Um, I, uh, most of them will make that different choice if we give it to them. Thank you both. We have a question? Yeah, a question. so just a couple of comments about that. Um, you know, we heard, um, we heard earlier from the high school students about how important that connection is and that connection with really you know, positive pro-social people and how a lot of people don't have that. We know, and as, and as Dan talked about, you know, trauma and the, the impact of trauma, societal trauma, racial and ethnic trauma that people have experienced and how that sort of perpetuates a cycle and leads them down um, a, a bad path. You know, a number of years ago, 
there was a, every school had prevention and intervention specialists in the school, and those were, uh, those were defunded when budget cuts hit. Um, our mental illness and drug dependency sales tax has put that back into 26 schools across the county. And with uh, the Best Starts for Kids levy that was just passed, we plan on trying to provide as much support as we can within the school. We understand that's an issue. Yeah, and so, so one promising practice that I want to bring up real quick that we've been working on is recovery high schools. And so we've been able to start two recovery high schools in the county, one through the Interagency Academy in Seattle Public Schools on Queen Anne, and one down south here in Kent, and Kent Phoenix Academy. And Kent Phoenix Academy takes um, students from all over the south end. And those are for kids who want to get better and who want help and who are involved in treatment. And it's a really promising practice. Um, the the um, the interagency school just celebrated, I think, their 20th or 25th youth um, that they have involved. And so it's really evolving really fast, trying to provide safe um, areas for kids to learn um, and, and trying to provide those supports. Because you're right, I mean, those supports are really what the youth need. I was going to, at this time, ask our one of our school superintendents, school. Um, Claire Wilson, uh, I'm on the school members. board. I just have a question. Um, we've had a lot of focus on our high school youth, and I noticed on the slides, young adults were identified age 25 and above. So um, I'd like to find out a little bit more about kind of what we're talking about age span and what we do need to think about and clearly support, think about prevention. We also are talking about young adults that are out of a system. Um, that perhaps a public school, um, elementary or otherwise, is unable to support. So the other piece um, I'm interested in thinking about are how are we supporting our uh, kind of the older youth that are out of that transition? Who would want to take that one? I would say that's a very big gap. And the... Um, the vulnerability for our kids once they get out of, you know, they make it out of high school and they're in the college sort of age, that really is, um, it is a time where there's a big risk. The, when we look at uh, deaths of um, heroin overdoses, it's, it's, you know, it is that young, early 20s are the group of kids that, that have the overdoses and die that you are surprised about. So we're, we're far, far away from understanding that. I think that, um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about tonight, and it's, it's, you know, Dan and Jim talked about, we have criminalized this for decades, and, it will, and we are just now starting to recognize it as the health condition that it is. Um, it will take a while to move in that direction. If, you know, if Ken was opening up a hospital or just a health facility, there wouldn't be that kind of concern. Um, but the concerns are there, and they're there for real reasons because of the way that we have approached it in the past. Um, the, um, ex the best way that I see for us to go forward with our younger adults, and when we look at the, the, um, the teenage brain, the teenage brain is 20, you know, your teenage brain well into your 20s, um, this is the best way to do it, is to start now, to recognize that we have failed um, our kids that right now that are in their 20s, um, but we, we can do better for the future. Yes, ma'am, please come forward. Can you identify yourself and any affiliation? I'm Peggy Beck. I'm just a resident here in Federal Way, and I have a question for Jim. I, I don't think I understood Tell me, uh, explain the difference between somebody selling for profit and not for profit. I work for the profit of paying my rent. <laughs> right. So I don't um, understand that statement. What we found, uh, the people that we were arresting over and over and over in uh, the downtown area of Seattle, and now that I'm with the county, it's the same demographic. There's a group of people who will possess to consume and who are not addicted. They, they can function, just like many people can function by consuming reasonable amounts of alcohol, and once they consume it, they don't engage in dangerous or harmful behavior, assaulting others, driving under the influence. So you have that group. You have groups who consume and who become addicted and become addicted to the point where they are homeless, uh, they're jobless, um, 
as we've talked about, their families have given up on them. They end up in homeless shelters or even worse, under Interstate 5 or Highway 18. Um, then we have a group, and so they can't support their habit. Uh, they don't have, an, an, and now under the Affordable Care Act, they can, if they have good case management, they can navigate their way into treatment, but it's very difficult for, as uh, we heard earlier from Darcy. Um, so they have to sell something in order to make that money. So they either s sell themselves uh, sexually or they will grab three to four to five grams of drugs from a for-profit seller and he will say, if you sell these six or five or three, I'll give you one. So that's their motivation. So they take the risk. So we found that they were not the gun carriers, they were not the house burglars, they were not breaking into cars to get their money to, dry, to, the, to buy the drugs. They were selling small portions of drugs while not engaging in harmful behavior other than harm to themselves. Uh, and we were putting them in jail. The ones that they're selling too. I'm sorry? Harmful to the ones they're selling yes. too though. Absolutely, there's harm all around but they're not the ones who were importing large amounts or uh, getting a bunch of sellers to go out there and not taking the risk and then enforcing with violence. So we don't allow anyone who's committing violence or exploiting others to become eligible for this initiative. And you know, just on that, uh, just a little story. I, I used to uh, do treatment services directly, and so I was working with a gentleman who was a chronic uh, alco alcoholic, right? He had an alcohol problem. And so he came to me, and, um, and he had drank and broken his probation, and the judge was gonna send him to jail for the weekend. So I'm like, okay, let's make a real uh, a, a direct, intentional effect to make this a really good therapeutic weekend. We can think a lot about it, and then when you come back on Monday, we'll talk about it, and we'll, we'll see how it went. Right, so he comes back on Monday and I'm like, okay, so did you learn anything? And he's like, yeah, I learned how to make math. Right, and so you, it just goes to show you sometimes a criminal justice response of what we think of us pro-social people as punishment can really do more harm than it can do good. Any more questions before we have asked the panelists to have a last word? Any more questions? Again, I wanna thank um, uh, the students who met with us earlier, and again, I think you saw the best and brightest of two principals who uh, are committed, not just involved in education, both in the classroom and outside the classroom, so I'm really pleased to see them here tonight. So maybe if each panelist can maybe share some last minute thoughts of after tonight's program, right? You know, I just thank you for having this, uh, thank you to Council Member Von Reichbauer and to panelists and everybody in the audience. The, the conversation's changing, um, from what it was um, a number of years ago. When I started in this business 18 years ago, um, I was known as the hug-a-thug guy, and that wasn't a really nice thing. I was the guy who went and tried to help people when they were in jail and in prison from coming back. Um, and now we're in this amazing progressive community where we're really trying to help people, and we're really learning from our experiences. And what you've seen and heard here tonight is, is just that, and what I've heard and seen from our community is just that. Um, a week ago, Tuesday, we had a, another type of community conversation in the, in the city of Renton. We heard from 120 people, and it's just the same thing. It's how can we help? It's rare that we um, come across a person in the community who doesn't know somebody who, or who is not impacted by somebody who has a mental health illness or a substance use disorder. We're all impacted, we've all felt it, or most of us have. And so, and so I, I just thank you for that. The one thing I'll, I'll leave you with today um, is something that I learned last Tuesday when we were asking people you know, what works, and it's having the conversation. It's communicating, it's reducing stigma. For me, it's letting, it's letting you know that my brother died of a drug overdose, right? And that, and that we're, trying to help other people from experiencing it. We're trying to help the next generation of high schoolers um, from having to experience that. So thank you for coming out tonight. It was an honor and a pleasure, and uh, uh, thank you again. Thank you, and I um, also wanna thank all of you for being here, and, um, and to thank the students. It was really a great opportunity. I have a 
ninth grader myself, and I um, was thinking that, boy, um, you guys are very mature and um, well-spoken. I can't imagine my son doing the same thing. So um, <laughs> so thank you. The, um, but I will also say that having a son makes me, um, you know, in, in this age group, very uh, happy to know what we're doing and very uh, I'm optimistic about the future. I also have been having this conversation my entire career and um, and talking, and it is very encouraging that people are listening um, and listening in all kinds of different ways. Um, I'm um, excited for my um, partners here in the criminal justice system to um, really be um, very um, authentic and sincere and understanding and. I'm really impressed with Dan's library collection mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and shows to me his true commitment and the commitment that we have in our community. And we live in a great place and it's a great time. And I know that we're gonna make a real difference. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here again tonight. Um, I learn something uh, anytime I get to participate in an event like this. Um, I, I promise you, all good cops will always take care of the violent people, and the prosecutors will prosecute them. Those who abuse, those who exploit, those who murder, rape, who are committing the Violence Act. I promise you will take care of those. But we've, Dan and I have talked, uh, I've talked with all of his prosecutors. Um, there's a lot more that we can do in prevention. And if we can, if we just put a little bit more money into uh, prenatal care, postnatal care, making sure children read at grade level by the third grade, do the nurse family partnership program with those families that need it. Um, we would reduce addiction. Oh, and give parenting classes. Teach people how to parent. Uh, we would really reduce the trauma that leads to many of these addictions to all drugs. And remember, alcohol is the most abused drug. So, um, and support your teachers. Uh, they're, they're dealing with so many other issues, as the principal mentioned, other than just teaching kids how to read, write, and do math. So, if you have access to elected officials, uh, R1, um, make sure to think, what can we do to prevent this end of the line uh, tragic unneeded deaths or years of addiction or recovery. So thank you. I just want to say that I had a uh, wonderful time uh, d discussing this issue with the students and, and they really, they get it. They think they understand it more than we give them credit for and more than we probably do as well. One young man from the Federal Way Public Academy, is that what it's called? His father assigned him a book report on heroin. Go learn all you can about this thing. Get the facts. And that's, you know, education is power. And we all, we all need to do that uh, and, and understand that those little white pills that the doctor prescribed, just because the doctor prescribed them doesn't mean that they're safe. It doesn't mean that they're good. And so many, so many kids start with taking the pills in their parents' medicine cabinet. So maybe tonight you should go home and see what's in your medicine cabinet and figure out how to get rid of it if you don't really need it because that, that will find its way somewhere uh, that will cause harm. And the other young woman from Todd Beamer says, don't overthink it. <laughs> and I think there's some, there's some wisdom to that too. These are our kids, this is our community, these are our fellow citizens, and, and it, it's a test of our humanity, uh, but I think we're up to that. So thank you very much for having us tonight. This young lady got a full ride scholarship to Gonzaga, right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's been said that the uh, classic definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Tonight you heard from four experts who are gonna break that chain. And with your help, we will break the chain for a lot of folks. Thank you very much for coming here.